morning, everyone. Welcome to City Hall. We're getting ready for a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to City Hall, welcome to Council Chambers, and welcome to a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council for today, Tuesday, February 11th, 2003. The City Council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday at 10 a.m. Meetings are open to the public. We invite you to join us. For those of you unable to attend council meetings, we can be viewed live on your cable station, channel 35. Council meetings can also be viewed live via webcast from the city's homepage or heard via council phone. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Bernson, Galenter, Garcetti, Grohl, Hahn, Holden, LeBanche, Misikowski, Pacheco, Perry, Reyes, Weiss, Sign, Padilla, 10 members present, and the quorum, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Before beginning with the matters appearing on today's agenda, this being Tuesday and the first meeting of the week, we do have scheduled both a salute to the flag and a moment of inspiration to introduce our guest. Let me recognize the council member of the 9th District, Council Member Jan Perry. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I have a very special lady here today, and uh, she will lead us in our moment of inspiration. This is Angela Harris, and she is here today to sing a song entitled Tightrope, an inspirational piece that she wrote herself. She is originally from Ohio and has been a resident of Skid Row, of one of the Skid Row Housing Trust uh, buildings in downtown Los Angeles. She started as a volunteer intern six months ago and then was trans transitioned into employment with the Skid Row Housing Trust. Currently, she is an administrative assistant at 619 East 5th Street at the service spot for Skid Row Housing Trust, helping the staff with supply orders and event planning. Her songs lift the spirits of her co-workers and her community, and I'm very happy to present Angela to you today uh, so that she can share her gifts with all of us. As she likes to say, she's a Skid Row sister, and I know her words and her harmony will inspire all of us. And so I'd like to present to you Angela Harris to lead us in the flag salute and then her song. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, for which is of America, for, <laughs> the public, for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm 
know it's wrong, but life on the tightrope had become my home, and I guess I'll just reason with my senses, and I'll slowly let down my defenses, cause Thank you very much, colleagues, and I, I just want to say this is a kind of talent that uh, we produce here in this, from the Skid Row community. Uh, she's just one of many talented people from the Skid Row community, so thanks for allowing us to uh, present Angela to you today, and thank you, Don Garza, for being vigilant and reminding us, or reminding me every day, at least five times a day, that Skid Row cares too. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Madam Clerk, first order of business, please. Approval of the minutes. Ms. Perry moves and Mr. Reyes seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Holden moves and Ms. Misikowski seconds. Before beginning the regular agenda, there are several items that have been requested to be continued. Item number one, a request from Council Member Hahn to continue that matter for 30 days to March 14th. Members request to continue item number one by the 15th Council District. Is there any objection to that? Seeing none, item one shall be continued. Also a request to continue item number 21 to Friday, which is February 14th. Members request to continue item number 21. Next Tuesday, I have a request in for this Friday. If, okay. Next Tuesday then is February 18th. That'll be the new hearing date for item 21 without objection. Mr. President, Next. Mr. Holden. One, one through 21, is that correct? We're item. continuing item number 21. Oh, we, all right. So I was, are we, are this include, I didn't hear your first call. Does this include 18, 19, 20? Wait, we're not calling specials yet, Mr. Holden. I would call them special when you get to them. Okay. Madam Clerk. Uh, next uh, item for continuance, item number 40, request on behalf of Councilmember Padilla to continue that matter for one day to February 12th. Members request to continue item number 40. Uh, Madam Clerk, which item is that? Uh, that is a, a motion. It's okay. a... Right. Uh, for one day. To for tomorrow. one day. Members without objection, item 40 is continued. And there are confirmations of city officials. Uh, do you wish to take those matters up first? Uh, let's take those matters first. There was a request on one of these city officials for that matter, item number 21. Ah, we have continued. Okay, next, other city okay. officials, please. Item number nine is confirmation of Mr. An Trong to the Quality and Productivity Commission. It's an audits and governmental committee report. Uh, public hearing has been held in the committee. Okay, if you can come forward at this time. Members of the public hearing haven't been held. Please take a seat. Has been held on this item. Are there members wishing to pose any questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, I believe we're ready for a vote. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Congratulations and thank you for your service. Thank you. Next item, please. Item number 10 is confirmation of Mr. Bradley H. Midland to the City Planning Commission. It's a Planning Land Use Management Committee report, and a hearing has been held in committee. Okay, thank you for being here, Mr. Midland. Uh, public hearing has been held in committee, but we do have members wishing to be heard. Let's begin with Mr. Weiss, followed by Mr. Zine and Mr. Garcetti and Mr. Reyes. Mr. Weiss. I defer to the chair of the committee who I thought had pushed this button. 
Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Councilmember Weiss. First, I just want to thank Mr. Medlin. He did thank come you. before committee. Uh, the full committee was there. My understanding, if the city clerk can correct me, because there's only one signature on the report, I have to yes, verbalize the motion. Yes, the motion is required. Okay, so I'd like to uh, make the motion to appoint Mr. Medlin to the Planning Commission. I just want to take this opportunity to thank him for his good work. I look forward to working with you as we uh, go through our, our cases in our city. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Midland, congratulations to you. Um, I think you're going to win this vote. <laughs> and uh, this is going to be um, hopefully the first of many easy votes for you in your yes. life as a commissioner, although there are going to be some tough ones because um, the city faces so many challenges. The city uh, faces this incredible pressure to keep growing, and yet we have uh, countervailing pressures from communities. Uh, your background as an attorney in, in the private sector uniquely qualifies you to deal with these pressures and to, uh, to fairly weigh the balance, weigh the equities, balance the equities, uh, and make really good public policy. Uh, you're going to be aided in this by uh, a really strong commission that you'll be serving on and by the fact that the committee that will oversee the actions uh, of your commission, headed by Mr. Reyes, is also a very strong, good public policy committee. So um, you are a welcome addition to this team. And uh, on behalf of myself and my office, we very much look forward to your service and to working with you. Good luck, Mr. Bedlin. Thank you for your votes and confidence. Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good morning to you, Riley. Good morning. I uh, just want to offer my congratulations. I know your dedication to the community and all the wonderful things you've done, all the wonderful groups you work with, and you've supported in any and all ways possible. This is one more task, one more aspect of your life that you'll devote to the city of Los Angeles. It's a very, very important position as that planning takes place throughout the city of Los Angeles for development, et cetera. I know you're qualified beyond the qualifications and your commitment, your dedication, I want to offer my personal congratulations and wish you well as you spend many, many more hours over the issues that will come before you. Congratulations to you. Thank you, Mr. Zion. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President, and congratulations, Brad. I, I know I was one of, of a number of voices, no doubt, that uh, urged the mayor to keep you on as a commissioner and glad to see that uh, not only are you being kept on as a commissioner, but elevated to one of the most important commissions. And I want to congratulate you. And I could certainly echo what was said in terms of your own activism, um, Jewish community and the community at large and, and the great things you've done. Um, but we won't let you off that table without one question. So. Um, I, I urge all my colleagues to support Mr. Midland, but I'm curious to know um, how you think we can even, we've taken some great steps in involving neighborhoods in planning decisions, and obviously it's probably the thing that neighborhoods care the most about. What, what more can we do to involve neighborhood councils in the planning process, and, and what can you do as a commissioner to encourage that? I, I think that the most important things that we have to feel with the commission and the planning is a term that I use that's called smart growth. LA will be growing. We cannot stop the population but we have to use smart growth and do what works for the people, the community, and for the betterment of everybody in the city. So that's the best way I could answer that, it's just smart growth. <laughs> Other members? Seeing none, we are prepared for a vote. Madam Clerk, would you please open the roll? Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. And President. Thank you, too, for your service. Thank you. Both items 9 and 10 forthwith, please. And item number 45 is also a confirmation of Terrence J. Manning to the Emergency Preparedness Commission. Uh, this is a communication from the chair and member of Public Safety Committee. Uh, public, uh, public hearing has not been held. Okay, and I do not have requests from members of the public to be heard on this item. Is our nominee with us today? Please have a seat. Thank you for being here. Members wishing to be heard? On item 45, Ms. Misikowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a very, very commendable recommendation. Uh, Chief Manning has had experience uh, in, the, in the department in emergency preparedness and uh, is well, well equipped to fill the shoes of the chief who is retiring. And uh, I was very uh, happy to recommend this. I think Mr. Zine was there as well, but it wasn't a full committee. So uh, with the recommendation of both of us, we move this uh, confirmation of the appointment. Okay. Other, mem other members wishing to be heard on item 45, Mr. Zine. Thank you, Mr. President, colleagues. Um, 
You have a long history, your family, tradition of uh, fire service in the city of Los Angeles. When did that start? 1955. 1955. Yes, it's been one continual stream, correct? Certainly has, yes. Yeah, uh, the year I was born. Pardon me? Yeah, from the year I was born, a uh, family member started with service to the city. And other members of your family involved in that also, I understand? Yes. Okay. My uh, mother's Los Angeles City School teacher for 25 years, and my brother is also a Los Angeles City fire chief. And then your dad? And certainly my father. Right. So you grew up in this environment to see public safety, and you've dedicated your life to public safety. And as we see what's confronting us in this world of hostility, the fire service, the EMS is so essential, so critical. And as we have Homeland Security expanding and those different disciplines expanding to work in cooperation with law enforcement and the Operation Nighthawks and these other activities that we do, uh, it's a critical function that you're going to be assuming. And I know that the responsibility is going to be on your shoulders, the uh, accountability is on your shoulders, and I just want to wish you well in it because with all the things you've got to do, <laughs> there's just one more aspect of public safety and, again, that long tradition of your family history providing that to the people of Los Angeles. So wish you congratulations, and I know you can do well with that, and I'm sure your family is extremely proud of this new uh, assignment that you're going to get, which is critical in our time uh, of uh, uncertainty in our city and our society. So congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Other members wishing to be heard mm. on item 45? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Forthwith, please. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank Next you. items. Next items, Mr. President, items noticed for public hearings. Items 2, 3, and 4 are hearings on uh, street lighting districts, and there are, or, are ordinances on the files. Uh, members, items 2, 3, and 4 are now before us. I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council on these items. We shall deem the public hearings open and closed. Members wishing to call any specials? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk is opposed to taking a vote now. I do believe we expect 12 members today. Let's hold these ordinances on the desk as we await the arrival of another member and we'll take 12 votes on these items. Next items then, Mr. President, items five, six, and seven are also public hearing items and council should open the hearing and continue the hearing and ordinance to March Fourth, and I believe there is a card on item number five. Do we you wish have to call a card on special? item number five? Let's call that special. On item six and seven, I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council on these matters today. So we shall open the public hearings and without objection, continue them to March 4th. Ms. Hahn? Uh, Mr. President, I would just like to receive and file uh, item eight. Okay, and that's the next item for consideration. Item number eight now before us. We have a request from Ms. Hahn to receive and file this item. We do not have speaker cards on item number eight. Is there any objection to receiving and filing item number eight? Seeing none, item eight is received and filed. Madam Clerk. Next item is Mr. President, items for which public hearings have been held, items 11 through 24. There is an ordinance on item number 11. Uh, let's hold item 11 on the desk awaiting a 12th member leaving items 12 through 24 with the exception of 21, which has been continued. Members, any specials? Ms. Gruel. Item 18 and 19, please. 18 and 19, call special by Ms. Gruel. Any other specials? Mr. Holden. Uh, f 15, I would respectfully request that it go to the Environment, Quality, and Waste Management Committee. And okay. Members request to refer item 15 back to the Environmental Quality Committee. Is there any objection? Seeing none, item 15 is so referred. Uh, and Mr. President, uh, item 20 special. Item 20 call special by Mr. Holden. Any other specials? Mr. Labonge. Nope. Thank you for calling my name. <laughs> Any other specials? All right. I see 20, 24 up here. I mean, what was your call? Your call through what? Up to? Through item 24. Through item 24? Okay. Then item uh, 24 special. Item 24, call special by Mr. Holden. Seeing no other specials, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the balance of the items. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Those are approved. Next item, please. Next item, Mr. President, items for which public hearings have not been held, items 25 through 43. 
And I do not have requests from members of the public to address the council on these items. We shall deem the public hearing satisfied. Members, any specials? Items 25 through 43. 42 call special by Mr. Zine. Excuse me, Mr. President. On item number 25, that is an award of bids. Um, do you wish me to read the announcement of the winner of the bids and let's the take, true interest cost? Let's take requests for specials on 26 through 43 first. Mr. Holden. 26 special. 26 call special by Mr. Holden. Mr. Garcetti. Seven, please. Which matter? 37. 37? Yeah. Call special by Mr. Garcetti. Uh, we have a request to call item 35 special for an amending motion. Any other specials, Mr. Reyes? Yes, um, item 38, we can continue that to February 21st um, for Councilman Pacheco. Okay, members request to continue item 38 to February 21st without objection, so ordered. Any other specials? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on the balance of items 27 through 43. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Bringing us back to item number 25, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Uh, this morning, a uh, bid was open, or bids were open in the city administrative officer's uh, office, and the winner of the bid was Merle Lynch and Company, and this is a ward of sale of water systems subordinate revenue bonds refunding series and wastewater system revenue bonds for the par amount of $358,815,000 and a true interest cost of 4.796365%. And a resolution is also attached. For okay, Mr. Weiss moves. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll on item 25. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. On the supplemental agenda, item number uh, 44 is an item for which public hearing has been held. Uh, members, item 44 now before us. Special, please. Ms. Perry calls that matter special. We have held public hearing on item 44. A motion from the floor would be required to reopen the public hearing. Next item, please. Uh, going back to the items called special, item number five was called special for cars from the public. Item number five now before us, and the council calls forward Toby Mazzi at this time. Toby Mazzi, are you with us? Item number five. Hello, my name is Toby Mazzi, and I'm a property owner along um, Baker Street and Spring Street, and um, <clears throat> we, in regards to the street lamps, uh, we, I have a petitions from the majority of the property owners right there, and there's only about five buildings that concern this, uh, this issue. And um, <clears throat> we're, we're for the street lights, but we um, would like the vintage looking street lights installed. So I'm kind of unsure as 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 what to do um, if we if we as property owners vote this down, do we lose our funding um, for that? And does that mean that we'll never get streetlights in there unless we pay for the installation ourselves? As it is now, the installation, from what I understand, is going to be um, paid for by the uh, the Gold Line or, or MTA. And, um, and the property owners will then pay for the uh, yearly assessment. So I, I'm asking for some advice here on, on how to perhaps handle this, this issue. I know that it's in uh, Mr. Uh, Reyes's district, so um, maybe he could uh, give me some advice on that. Maybe Mr. Reyes's Ed. staff. Ed. 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 Mr. Reyes. Mr. Reyes. Mr. Holden, uh, can you Mr. give uh, Mr. Reyes some breathing room here? Uh, I'm Toby Maisie, and um, I own property along Baker Street, and I, I believe I sent your, your, um, your office a letter regarding the street light issue there, where I have all the, well, the majority of the uh, property owners have signed a petition that we want the uh, vintage looking or ornate street lights, because we feel it's kind of a historical looking area there. Right. Some of the buildings dating, you know, from 1890, so. Right. No, I, I understand it's a very historic place. Actually, that's where the uh, 
The struggle for a women's uh, right to vote began in one of the, those buildings. Yeah, the well, the women's building, which right. is, has some historical significance. The, well, one of the key issues there is working with the Bureau of Street Lighting to start an assessment process. We have uh, what the budget calls out for, which are the basic model of lights. We want to do improvements that are vintage or have certain characteristics. We need to work with you to begin that process for that incremental increase in cost for different lights. So that's something we will be engaging you with. But now, from my understanding, we, we as property owners have to have our ballots in today to um, approve or disapprove of the, um, the street lights as specified on that ballot. And that, uh, those specified are the modern uh, freeway looking ones, if you will. Right. Um, so I just don't, do we need to vote this down because we, we can vote that down today. Right. Mr. Macy, do me a favor, Mr. we can get together in the, in the side here and we can take care of that detail with my staff. Okay. Mr. Macy, thank look. you for being here. Let me close public comment and we'll hold this matter on the desk thank allowing you. you the opportunity to meet with uh, staff representatives of the first council district. Madam Clerk, let's proceed to the next item. Next item, Mr. President, item number 18 was called special by council member Gruel. Ms. Gruel. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have uh, before us the item relative to the housing trust fund. And uh, I want to thank at this point my colleagues uh, who have worked so carefully um, in addressing the affordable housing, uh, Mr. Garcetti and Ms. Hahn, uh, Mr. Reyes, who serve on this committee. And we have looked at both the housing trust funds and looking also at item 19, which is relative to uh, 46. Um, I am in, uh, really pleased that we are standing here today with a plan for our affordable housing trust fund, a plan that is going to allow us to have uh, more funding for home ownership, for modernization, for rehabilitation, for the creation of more uh, multifamily housing units. Uh, this housing trust fund in cooperation with the mayor's office um, and uh, Sarah Dussault who is here have really, uh, we have accomplished a lot and I want to thank all the advisory board members. Um, I don't see them here today but they have been here at all of our meetings. We've had several public hearings that were held out in the community both in Mr. Garcetti's district and my district. Uh, the advisory committee spent several months coming up with recommendations. This is going to be a road map for how we can address the issue of affordable housing here in Los Angeles. We also know that there are a lot more things we need to do to accomplish that goal to create more housing. But I also want to thank the housing department um, who is going to implement uh, this housing trust fund in our policies. We, we do have to roll up our sleeves and make sure we get these funds out as quickly as possible, which is our next item number, uh, item number 19, which allows us to be competitive on Proposition 46. So um, I just wanted to let everyone know that this has been an extraordinary uh, accomplishment, um, an experience that has been a partnership uh, between both the public and the private sector and our constituents who participated in that process. Uh, so I'm asking for an I vote and again want to thank my colleagues, uh, many of who uh, began this issue uh, prior to me even being elected, who uh, pushed hard for that housing trust fund. So I want to thank you all uh, for that leadership as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, colleagues, it used to be that with housing, um, there was an issue that people, A, really didn't care about in the city, and B, that people thought government didn't have a role in. Certainly, we had experiences when the federal government tried to build housing. We have some projects. Councilmember Hahn has them. And I think we've all accepted throughout the country that the government doesn't build housing very well. But what government does well is become a catalyst for making sure that there is housing at all levels, both the affordable um, part of the spectrum as well as right through market rate and onto luxury housing. There's bad news out there. We have less than 3.5% vacancy rate in this city. 12% is what the rents are estimated to rise next year in this city. As things are getting worse and worse, we have had a historic coalition here that's come together it's been business and labor and government and nonprofit sector together saying we will come up with what is now going to be and now is and now will be spent out as the largest per capita trust fund for affordable housing in the country. You all made this possible. 
You all made this possible. The mayor's office made this possible. And the warrior who leads the uh, Housing and Community Development Committee, Wendy Gruel, made that possible. I was amazed to see when we can barely get people sometimes at public hearings to see how many people showed up at those two public hearings and how important it is in poll after poll over the last few years to residents of Los Angeles that we solve the housing crisis. This is just the first step, but it's a great first step. I want to say one thing technically too. I know that there's been some questions about the funding and we've asked the mayor's office to report back. We have one concern with the CRA uh, part of the funding to make sure that uh, we establish for the record right now that money isn't taken from one project area and pooled right now without the approval of those council members or without some finding of benefit to other areas. And I want to underscore that as we look at how we do the funding because I think there are council members who have things underway or the negotiations and thoughts for housing underway and this would kind of throw a bit of a, a curveball into the mix. So as we get that report back, I'm sure we can work that out. But congratulations to the mayor for stepping up on this and being such a leader. Congratulations to all the members of the committee as well. This is really an amazing day. I think as Janice Hahn put it in committee, to get to the point where we're actually talking about not whether we'll get the money or if we'll get the money, but how we're actually going to spend it is a really exciting day in Los Angeles. Congratulations to all of you. Mr. Holden. As President, remember, it's clear here that uh, we need this program in place. When you see that there are 372,000 overcrowded units in the city of Los Angeles, I think what we didn't say in this report is that where those houses most needed, you're going to find that uh, once the program is in place, then the competition is going to, con going to start. And item number 19, you have houses and you, we use tax credits. We use that program. If this money in item 18 is to be used as a leverage to help fund or come up with the best plan for affordable housing, then we should have some priority areas whereby we would use these funds in order to provide for affordable housing. Uh, some areas, as you will discover, do not want low and low and low medium or whatever the case may be housing in their districts. And it becomes nothing more than a slogan. Then the question is, where can we put them and how quickly can we get them there and where are they most needed? Uh, I think that uh, when you bring a report like this to us, and as I commend the mayor for funding it, that we should talk about the area or the areas where we can put these houses. We should establish the priority right now up front so there would be no, no question about it uh, where uh, the tax credit programs or plans that we subsequently vote on should go. So uh, it's a good program, but please keep that in mind. Do you want to, I would trust that you would initiate that kind of a effort rather than have me put a motion in to say, all right, now we have programs of 18 and 19, where do we start? I, I would trust you would do that, right, Ms. Grew? All right, thank you. Mr. Labonge. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning again. Uh, wonderful words by all my colleagues, uh, one, two, three, four, and I think I want to call on Ed Reyes, though, just to say that this is, just fits in what Ed's doing as our chair of land use in our discussions about now where do we push the housing. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity that we have to take charge of what Mr. Holden just spoke of as far as where we're going to do it. You know, we just spent $4.2 billion on a subway system from North Hollywood to the central part of the city, and that corridor has to be looked at. We just are going to be spending a cross valley busway, and that corridor has to be looked at. The blue line to Long Beach in the areas of Los Angeles, that corridor has to be looked at because the closer you are to transit, the easier it is to enjoy and love Los Angeles because you don't have the hassle of the extra commute, which is so important. So I just wanted to tag that in because so often uh, Chairman Reyes speaks about the need to do good land use planning and with this uh, advancement, Council Member Gruel, in your efforts and Mr. Garcetti's uh, is this opportunity now to try to create that, to focus that, to push that, to create the opportunity for those to live uh, 
in housing and uh, make sure that our departments are prepared to work diligently with the agencies and organizations that are building housing so we really give them an encouragement so that they can get it done. It's so important to do that. So I just want to congratulate my colleagues. I have been uh, uh, not the advocate that you all have been in this area, but I'm certainly going to be there for all of us, for all the people of Los Angeles, to create the housing of the future. Congratulations to all those who spent all the time on it. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Tom. I just want to take this opportunity to thank the mayor's office and all their hard work, the department, for their due diligence in working with us. And uh, Councilmember Gruel in the uh, marathon sessions we were having to get these policies out, I know it's been very trying, but it's very well worth it. When you look at some of the basic statistics here, a single full-time worker in Los Angeles needs to earn $21.15 to afford an average apartment. Yet we know that more than 60% of the city's residents are renters, more than 60%. In District 1, 85% of the district are renting. So we look at the issue of density. The citywide population density averages 7,600 per square mile. When we look at CD1, for example, including Highland Park, Cypress Park, Lincoln Heights, and Pico Union Westlake, we're looking at 20,000 residents per square mile. So the obvious message here is that there's a real congestion in the market. There is not enough of a housing stock out there to allow for a range of housing to be accessible to the person who is at the low, very low income stratum, let alone the folks who are working even in the city in mid-management, that can even afford to rent in the city of Los Angeles. So we are in dire straits. I keep encouraging the department that we need to put together the kind of systems that were very, very constructive, effective when we were operating after the earthquake hit. And believe me, the kind of experience, a dire need that we have in our communities, it is as if an earthquake has hit. That's the kind of need we have. And that's the kind of due diligence we should be getting from our departments. We're there to support you. We're there to work with the mayor's office. And again, thank Councilman Gruel for her great work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, we're prepared for a vote. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Item 18 is approved. Next item, please. Next item, Mr. President, uh, there are count 12 council members uh, present. Do you wish to take up the ordinances that were being held on the desk? And that Let's take one vote on all ordinances before us. That would be 2, 3, 4, 11, and 27. Uh, 26 is an ordinance, however, that was called special by council member Holden. Okay. All ordinances not called special. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Those are approved. Ms. Perry, did you wish to be recognized? To take, uh, yeah, if, if I may, uh, I request that uh, item 44 be taken out of order. And I wanted to introduce an amendment uh, to a motion that's already uh, on the desk. And okay. it's, on, it's on people's, uh, it's been distributed already. Members, is there an objection to taking item 44 out of order? Seeing none, let's take up item 44 next. Ms. Perry, is this an amendment technical in nature? Yeah, well, actually it's substantive. Well, and you have uh, the, floor. Uh, the uh, outcome would be that uh, uh, because of the reasons listed uh, in the uh, text of the motion and uh, concerns raised about the bidding process, um, I would ask that um, we uh, require the uh, CAO to review the bidding process in this case and report back to council in two weeks with uh, recommendations because of the impacts uh, that this process has had on uh, council districts 8, 9, and 10. Okay, any discussion on the amending motion? Mr. Weiss. I'd like to ask Mr. Deaton and the city attorney to come to the table. I will, I will say that uh, what carries the greatest amount of weight here is that I see 
that the representative from District 9 has su su submitted this motion, and I will take very seriously her request. Um, having said that, um, do you know, either of you know of any defects in the RFP process here? Please hold my time. No. no. Mr. Cervantes, if you could please join us at the table. If I could ask the city attorney, Representative, could you identify yourself and tell us if you know of any defects in the RFP process. Uh, Kitty Reavers, uh, Deputy City Attorney. No, I found no defects in the RFP process. Have, have you looked at the RFP process here? Yes. Describe for us the work you've done and what your findings are. Uh, I examined uh, the fact that the, we advertised in, uh, a, as we normally do and accepted bids from those who uh, provided a bid, uh, those who were not pleased with the process after it was evaluated and a bidder uh, was selected. Uh, we provided a, an appellate uh, process. Uh, they appealed and... Um, Can you pull the mic closer to your mouth? Yes, and after appeal, we found that there was nothing that would prohibit uh, uh, us from going forward as is After an appeal, you said? Yes. There's been an appeal? Yes, there was an Who appeal. Who adjudicates the appeals? Pardon? How are the appeals adjudicated? Uh, we had a panel of, uh, I appeared, uh, Mr. Cervantes appeared, uh, the uh, Delta uh, appeared with their representatives and presented their questions to the board. Is that the normal process for review of uh, contracts awarded through an RFP yes, process in this type of area? Yes, it is. Is it customary and normal for the CAO to uh, do a review of an RFP process in the manner proposed by Motion 44C? No, it is not. Do you know of when it's been done recently? No, I, I do not. Mr. Deaton, do you? Oh, I, I, no, Mr. Dad, that's not fair. Mr. Deaton knows of, some, of everything. But tell us, Mr. Deaton, no, is, it, is it customary and normal to review an RFP process following a determination uh, on appeal that we've just heard from the city attorney? Is it customary and normal for this council to send such a matter to a CAO for review? In instances where members of the council have some concern over the process, it is not extraordinary. What happens is that the, uh, the city government goes through the process, and, and, and uh, this is uh, on occasions when uh, uh, one or more council members have concern about the process, to have either my office or the city administrative office to do a review to see uh, was it uh, um, appropriate or not is not uncommon. Does, as an automatic review, uh, uh, quite frankly, that's all we would be doing. Um, I'm trying to grapple with what value added would there be from a CAO review process when what the city attorney has described seems rather exhaustive. Can someone please shed some light on that? Well, a review of the city administrative office is always uh, beneficial uh, for all of uh, I'm sure they appreciate your, your assessment, Mr. Deaton. Um, and it's your assessment as the city attorney's representative here that uh, the city has acted properly in this in this regard. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And, oh, by the way, and I have no evidence to the contrary. I mean, I'm, I'm and and none, and none has been proffered in this discussion. Correct? If you mean offered, that's same. It's a, I don't know yeah. that legal language, but uh, nobody has suggested that. Other than other than the two council members who believe that there should be a review to ensure that there well, has been no problems. I appreciate that. Um, that's not where this began last week. It began with a discussion of trying to shift two contracts around without a basis, and now we're asked to go in a holding pattern. Um, is the CAO here? CAO representative here? I think he's behind a column over there. <laughs> Hold my time, please. So, Mr. Fujioka, what's just been described is a bidding process that appears to the department, the city attorney, and the CLA to have been proper. An appellate process that the city attorney has described, which has found no improprieties and has reviewed the uh, claims of the aggrieved party. 
There's a motion pending before the council now for your office to do a review. What value, in all honesty, in all candor, can you really add to this process? I haven't been personally involved in, in, this, um, in this RFP, in this selection process, so I can't, as a consequence, I can't personally attest to whether or not there are problems or, the, or there's the absence of problems. And so having our office review the process, um, I, I'm not sure it would cause any, any fundamental problems. That's a question of what value is added. Well, in, in all candor, we're, we're frequently asked to provide a, a third party perspective to a number of different uh, processes, um, RFPs, uh, anything of that sort. So we do, we, we have been asked to come in and provide our, our um, kind of impartial objective assessment of a process. Now so. it's my recollection from committee that Ms. Fung from your office testified before my committee that she thought that, uh, I mean, she recommended that my committee take the action it took. Oh, I understand that. So presumably, and Ms. Fung's a good employee of your office, correct? She's an outstanding employee. So, uh, and uh, I haven't seen an occasion where she's made a recommendation to my committee which was in error. I'm just saying, I haven't even, I think she's in the audience. I haven't talked to her about this one, this one particular issue, but. I don't want to put her I, on the spot. I don't but know I, if we have, do we have, I don't believe this is a time sensitive issue. And so it, it's really, um, we can go either with review or stand with the committee's report. The yeah, review, I, I'm not sure it would, would add any, would take away from this process, but maybe would bring a higher degree of, of confidence in the process. Well, perhaps, but I have, uh, as I say, up until the moment I saw my colleague from the 9th District signature on this, uh, I've had a lessened degree of confidence in the questioning that's been raised here. Um, and I want to make sure that we, uh, we only proceed down this path if it's the right thing to do. If it's not the right thing to do, I'm going to vote no. I certainly want to hear my colleague from the 9th District just pushed her button, and I certainly want to hear what she has to say. Why don't we uh, hear from Ms. Perry as the author of the motion uh, next, and then I have Ms. Misikowski and Mr. Holden. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, back in uh, 1999, I ran the census for the city of Los Angeles, and uh, I think I have firsthand knowledge of how to reach out effectively to communicate information to various monolingual, ethnic, and other types of communities. Um, I think one problem that I've always had as a, a city employee is that the city tends to choose the same periodicals, the same newspapers over and over and over again, but from a practical perspective, uh, for those of us who are elected officials, they don't always reach the communities that we are, are elected to serve because if you look at statistics, for example, La Opinion or uh, a Spanish language newspaper, which is a subsidiary of The Wave, I, I think you would find that in the South Los Angeles area, the actual subscriber or readership is quite low. Uh, it is also very low for, uh, for example, for the Los Angeles Times. Um, I, I think uh, in my cursory review of the facts of the situation that uh, one of the newspapers which uh, posted the information was Rafu Shimpo, um, um, which is a bilingual newspaper, but uh, very focused, at least within the city of Los Angeles, in the uh, little Tokyo area. And I don't know how much of a response you got, but quite frankly, a lot of people that we serve don't, don't necessarily read newspapers. Now, we do a lot of outreach to the nonprofit community, and one of the models that I have always found to be very successful and effective is what the Community Development Department does, which is their NOFA list of notice of funds availability so that they have a direct pipeline and a direct relationship and are constantly updating their database. Um, I myself have a problem pending with a, a response to an RFP process from another department um, where they became angry with an executive director of a nonprofit in my district and decided that she shouldn't qualify the next time around. And, you know, I'm having a review done right now. So if constituents raise a concern to me, I feel obliged to share it with my colleagues to see if we can uh, give some consideration. And again, like Mr. Fujioka says, the outcome may be that we build more confidence. And that's a good outcome. And um, I'm ready to vote whenever. If anybody else wants to uh, give up their time, I'm ready to call the question. Okay. Ms. Misikowski? 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Fujioka and, and those at the table, is this review going to be guided by the principles that we normally look at? That is, we've, got, we've conducted an RFP process, we closed the process, we put it out to certain bidders, we got response, it was evaluated as the city would normally do by independent folks looking at this. Is that the sum total of your review? And ultimately, with whatever comes from that review, what are the options that will be brought back to us? One, that the process is solid, that there were no irregularities, that the bid should go forward as recommended, or if you find anything, isn't the process we throw out this process and start over? I mean, what, what, what and so if you can answer those two questions, what is the range of what you would look at with this? The focus as you described is accurate. That's exactly what we, what, what we would look at. And yes, we would either validate the, um, the RFP process or we'd recommend that we cancel and start all over again. Okay, so, and so the only reason you're suggesting that this may have some validity at this time is to add potential further confidence, but it's within the framework of the process that was conducted, uh, that all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And when we have had issues in the past, and, and Mr. Weiss, we have, but it's been where there is a challenge by one party or another that there were irregularities, that perhaps the proposals weren't as thorough and didn't meet the letter of the requirement, that there was undue influence, et cetera. There are those kinds of issues that in the past in other kinds of uh, awards uh, for contract or awards of a project that were raised and very often the city attorney stepped in. So in this instance, the city attorneys looked at and felt it was fine, CDD looked at it and felt it was fine, and it's a third level review is now being asked by the CAO uh, to do, come back in two weeks, look at those issues as we would normally look at in an RFP process to make sure that there were not irregularities and that the process followed everything we asked of it. Yes, that's true. Okay. And, and um, to add one point, I did, I did have a chance to talk to Ms. Fong, and at this point, based on her input, um, she felt that the process was fine. And at this juncture, that is the position of our office, but an additional review can strengthen that validation. And, and was she able to confirm, or are you and those at the table able to confirm that there is not a time sensitivity to this? In other words, two weeks from I, I don't undue. believe there's a time sensitivity. Well, there, actually, there would be a time sensitivity issue in that there are two other contracts that are waiting to execute. Otherwise, we do not have it funding for them. If we're going to delay these contracts right now, or the decision right now to have it referred by the CAO's office, then we're going to have to ask council approval for us to execute contracts at least for one month for the existing three service providers. So we're talking about two weeks here. Two weeks. Well, we're we're beyond that time frame right now, so we're beyond any kind so of contract it period. Is time sensitive. It, yes, it is, Councilwoman. Thank you. And if I may, uh, Councilman, uh, the department it feels that it, it conducted a, a fair and equitable process, and we followed the same RP process that we've that's been has been considered standard for the city and approved by the CAO's office and CLI's office for a number of years. So we we stand behind uh, our process. Mr. Holden. Mr. President, remember, is, uh, two weeks won't make a difference. Uh, Ms. Perry is involved, and in, she knows she's more intricate involved in this now than she, last week. Uh, when you look at the uh, response to the RFP, it amounts to being sole source, whether the department would like to accept that or not. In fact, one of the organizations that prevail, MAOF, was informed, informed my office that they were not even notified of the other RFPs to serve the other areas. The information was not widely, was not disseminated to those departments, I mean to those organizations that could perform those kinds of services. Not until, except in this one organization that relates to Delta. I think if you want to make sure that everything was done above board, and I think that's what we want to do as a city, that it should be done by the CAO. In this case, it has been done in cases before. We should not rush to judgment when there are some apparent problems associated with the process. This is a sole source. Look at the other areas. How many responded to the harbor? 
How many responded to uh, the areas for uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, 13, 14 council districts? How many responded to those areas? We went out to RFP for no, no, three no, no. areas and How we, many received, responded? we received one, one proposal for yeah, each of those two see, and two for yours. And, you, and those are the ones who are there. The information was not widely disseminated. And also, when you look and see the areas that they serve, uh, they say CDBG funds allocated by council district. For though all those council areas, nothing is in this report suggests that they are specifying exactly where the money will be spent per council district. This is something that you should really want to look at. I mean, I understand how you feel very strongly. You are as emotional as I am, but you are a public servant as I am. And what you really want is the truth to rise to the top, just like any cream. And that's what we're looking for. If there's a shadow of a doubt, your position should be as mine. Check it out. And I would uh, support uh, Ms. Perry's motion and ask you to support it also respectfully. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. You know, when we look at issues of need in the city, there's need everywhere. And we look at formulas and how they've been distributing resources. I just want to put forth for my colleagues and first understand the time frame issue. But my point being here is that if we look at the SEPA 2, 3, and 5 that's rent allotted and restricted to 8, 9, 10 through a motion that was passed three years ago, the allotment by district is not very proportionate. As we look at SEPAs 1, 3, 4, 5, all these council offices have to split up 260,000. That brings down the allotment even lower per district. So if we're going to take this discussion to that point of being equal, let's really do that. And I'd like to do a friendly motion that speaks to looking at the total amount and let each council district be able to have access to a proportionate amount of what's left of the pie. So that is a friendly motion, but my question will, a concern I have is the time frame. Can we reallot proportionate to the districts so that we do have a fair playing field, if you will? Uh, yes, we can, Councilman. We can actually allocate the funds across the 15 council districts uh, via the SEPAs. We can certainly do that. So as you see, uh, council members, it's kind of confusing, but CDs districts 1 through 5 will get 23,680. Districts 6, 7, 11, 15 will get, will split up 23,679. Then CD8, CD9, CD10 will be able to split up 86,000 each in each district. So again, it's just an issue of a level playing field if we're going to go to this road, down this road. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. Reyes, I, I very much appreciate what you just said, and um, I would make the following uh, suggestion to you, friendly suggestion, which is um, I do not want your uh, policy proposal, which looks at how all of these funds are allocated globally, to get caught up in the hurly-burly of whether or not we approve this particular amended uh, 44C. So uh, if you make that motion by way of a formal motion. Uh, I will second it so it can come to my committee and we can have a discussion with aging. And I imagine aging would like to have a discussion about making sure that we allocate these funds in the most equitable manner, right? Certainly. And if, there's, if there is an, an, an equity that's been built into the system, I will help you change it in my committee. I don't want people to have to think they have to vote for this to do the good you're trying to do. I have seen, so I just want you to understand that I, that, that you want to say something, go ahead. Yeah. If we can fold it in today, it'll create an even playing field today. Uh, I don't understand why we would need to wait. Uh, if we had another year, that means. Well, let's separate the questions and, and do your thing. Okay, separate. That's, that's my, that's a friendly motion. Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, cause I'll, I'll vote, I'll vote, I'll support you okay. on what you're asking. Uh, if we can separate it out, uh, I don't see any, I just want you to know, and I really respect the fact that my friend from the 9th District put this forward today, um, without evidence and with, with 
with Ms. Fung's representation before the committee, with Mr. Cervantes and the department's representations, with Mr. Deaton's representations before us last week, Mr. Deaton's representations today, with the city attorney's representations today, and with Mr. Fujioka's uh, game efforts here today, uh, but a bottom line that I think we all did understand, um, I don't see a basis to do this, and I think we need to be fair to those very needy people out there who are counting on this money, who are counting on it being provided in a fair manner, and we all know if we could double the amount of money we would provide for elderly services in this, if there were a way to do this, if there were a way to make every provider happy, we would do it. Public resources are limited. This is an improper use uh, of public uh, resources, in my view, to try to take this uh, extra delay. Uh, and Mr. Cervantes has spoken to the fact that this is a time-sensitive proposal. I will vote no. Mr. Labonge. Mr. President, I call for the previous question. And you are the final speaker on the queue. This ends the discussion. Madam Clerk, the motion before us, please. Uh, you have Council Member Reyes' motion uh, to divide or allot the uh, dollars in this, within the SEPAs proportionately between the Council Districts. Okay. And before that we, we to consider this, Mr. Deaton, Mr. Fujioka. I, that particular motion would change, I believe, the process. I think that's... Um, and I think the city attorney can advise, but I believe there are specific, uh, what is in the RFP process is contracts for specific dollar amounts in specific areas. And that could very well change those dollar amounts in those contracts. Uh, and, and if you, so that motion I think would, would substand, well, so you, can, you can go to committee, but would, once the contracts are signed, it's a year from now before you. I Mr. Before Dean, you bottom line is you're recommending for a number of reasons to not separate. Well, as Mr. Ray has point of order, moved. I think what Mr. Dean is saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that the only way we can achieve with this contract, this approval right now, what Mr. Reyes wants to achieve is to reject the bids, go back to CDD, aging, start over, come in with the process under CEPRA under a more even across the board allocation of funds. That's the only way so it would be, it would really be not an amendment, but to reject this, not study it, and start over. The question is, do we want to do that now? with this contract over this year or approve the contract over this year and send your motion to committee for next year. Mr. Reyes. Staff, can we do the reallotment It'd be very and not jeopardize our time frames in absorbing our dollars as contracted with the federal government? Uh, twofold. If you're going to go out and, and realign the, the funding amount that we're talking about going to RFP, we're coming up to the end of the program year, so you're talking going into a new program year. It would be my recommendation, Councilman, if you do want to look at the realignment of the funding, that we go with the contract this year and give the instructions for the department to work with the CAO's office, CLI's office, to, to analyze the allotment of monies, and then prior to any further contract in the ensuing fiscal years, because there's going to be three options, then at that point we come before the council with a recommendation to reallot, real, uh, reallot monies to those three contractors, whoever they may be. My intention is not to hurt anyone out there who's expecting a service from this program. If we're going to be doing that, I'd rather follow your recommendation to make sure we do this properly. Correct and not hurt the delivery of service. Certainly, because right now it, it's a great idea, Councilman. It's just a matter of we're up against the end of a program year and then going on a new program. It's, it's very difficult for the Department Controller's Office to be able to conduct that kind of uh, assessment, do the RFP in a timely manner. Mr. Reyes, do you therefore uh, wish to move reallotment in future program years as opposed to the existing year? If, if that is what it takes to get it done, yes. Okay, Without hurting that's a motion. Services. Is there a second? And we will hear that in my committee forthwith, Mr. Reyes, and uh, okay. work on that with you. So that's a, an amended Reyes motion seconded by Mr. Weiss. That is the matter before us. First, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. On, on Reyes's motion, and then the mo do you wish to refer What's that then to us? your committee? Well, Mr. Holden, please point listen. Point. Mr. Holden, please yes, listen, and you'll yes, follow yes. with us. Mr. Reyes has amended his motion to pursue the reallotment for future program years. Well, we can vote yes on that. Well, that's what we're about to do. Yeah, but we please also. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 
12 ayes. Okay, now the next now the motion before motion. us, Madam Clerk. Uh, the next motion then is 44C, which is Councilmember Perry's motion uh, to instruct the CAO to investigate the bidding process and report back to the council in two weeks. And then that would be then continuing the balance of it and then to have the whole item again back on uh, February 25th. So the balance of the item remains at the council level or is referred back to committee? Right. Uh, Ms. Perry? Okay. Come on. You, want, you want it to come to committee or come to council? Uh, to, bring ca it back to council, that's better. Just to bring it. Is bring it to council. Right so bring it back to council. I'm, I'm yeah, fine. <laughs> okay. Well, you're voting no. So. Yeah, bring Just, it back to council. Fine. If he's going to vote no anyway, bring it back to council. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is that, so that clear to everybody? It is clear. <laughs> Madam Clerk, please open now. the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. Nine eyes, three noes. That is approved. Next item, please. Uh, next item, Mr. President, item number 19 was called special by Council Member Gruhl. Ms. Gruhl. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, we briefly touched on this item uh, dis when we were discussing item number 18. Uh, Proposition 46 was passed uh, by the voters in November, which gives us a unique opportunity again to build more housing in the city of Los Angeles and across the state. And to ensure that we are com as competitive as possible, um, our housing department working closely with the mayor's office uh, came up with a plan which allows us, and it is consistent with our housing housing trust fund to get these funds um, immediately on the street and to be the most competitive. And so um, I would just uh, move that we have an I vote on this item today. We will be coming back with the various projects, uh, but appreciate everyone's vote so we can be most competitive here in Los Angeles. Thank you, Ms. Gruhl. Other members wishing to be heard on item 19? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 20, call special by Council Member Holden. Mr. Holden, item 20. May I ask you to press your button, please? Members, uh, I think that we can have a little report on this. Just for information only, I plan to vote for it. Mr. and staff here to answer Mr. Holden's questions. Department staff. Department staff going once. Department staff going twice. You can hold it over. The mayor's office should be present. Mr. Brown. CDD. We have two options, Mr. Holden, either keep this on the desk to see if we can get staff here today or we can continue this matter to tomorrow. Wait, we have, we have a representative from CDD. And while he's walking up here, could we ask for items number 18 and 19 to go forthwith? Forthwith on 18 and 19. Edward Baker with the Community Development Department. Um, the recommendations that you have before you is for the utilization of the mayor's formerly known as UDAG funds. This is program income that can be used for a variety of purposes, and this is the mayor's office proposal that has been heard by committee and is now before uh, the council for approval. Uh, my question is, we're talking about, uh, about $2.7 million. You're giving this to various organizations. Uh, for the public interest and concern, you might want to just say what they are and why you're doing, why the money's been allocated for yeah. these organizations. I, I don't have the uh, item before me right now. If you could hold on for just a second, I get a copy of it. Very good. I just see one right here, the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce under free cash for college. It's a really good program. And I think that the public should know that their money is being well spent by the mayor's office, and that's why I call this special, is for information uh, only to the public. They know these pro they'll learn from your discussion that these programs exist, and they may be able to benefit from some of these programs. For us to just pass A through Z, whatever, it may not help us that much. And the uh, recommendation is, in total, 
uh, 17 different proposed projects allocated by the mayor's office. Uh, the first is a Bellevue master Park Master Plan uh, for 50,000, California Youth Theater, Echo Park Elysian Valley Bridges II Intervention Team, uh, EDA matching funds in the Cornfields Project, uh, free cash for college, LA's Best, the, uh, the program in the, uh, in the schools, uh, Laurel Plaza Evening Farmers Market, uh, some consulting services from Mark Briggs and Associates to help us prepare applications for federal funds, uh, the Marlton Square Project, neighborhood legal services, uh, the PACE program will be receiving supplemental funding in, in this, uh, in the Mayor's UDAG. Uh, the search to involve Filipino Americans, St. Elizabeth Catholic Church, uh, UCLA Anderson School, Valley Economic Development Corporation, Vermont Slauson Retail Center, the Women's Care Cottage, and then a few late additions, uh, which aren't reflected in my notes here. The Malton Square project, a million dollars? Correct. That was a part of a previously approved uh, Marlton Square project. Is that project going to go? That's uh, an eighth district, right? Correct. Uh, the, two, the three additional projects are Chinatown Service Center, Harbor Area Gap, and the Teen Post program. Okay, I just thought it was interesting that uh, uh, to make this information known to the public, in fact, I'm learning something my, as well, and we perhaps, uh, like LA Best, some people don't even know what that is. Uh, you have the bridges, LA Bridges, they don't know what that is. Uh, I won't belabor the point, but I think it would have been good to say, here's what LA Bridges is about, here's what this LA Best is about, so they'll know what they're spending the money on. on this. $3.909 million. Okay, I have no further question. Four point nine. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Other members wishing to be heard on this item? Ms. Hahn. Well, I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, just follow up on Councilman Holden's, and, and you're right, the public does deserve to know where this money is going, and I, I want to say that I'm pleased um, that uh, the mayor has uh, allocated $100,000 in this to go to the gang alternative program, um, which will be trying to prevent kids from joining gangs in the first place. And uh, we've got a major effort in the city to uh, combat gang violence. Uh, we've really had a crackdown on gangs, but I think this shows real vision um, that maybe the only way we really win this war is to grow up another generation of kids all over Los Angeles that will choose not to join gangs in the first place. Uh, and I think this is going to be dollars really well spent. So I, I really want to thank the mayor for having vision in that area. Thank you, Ms. Hahn. Other members? Mr. Holden, for a second. Uh, the, the, uh, this legal services, neighborhood legal services, $90,000. What do they do? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Um, Neighborhood Legal Services uh, provides assistance to individuals who many times don't have representation, whether it be in a housing issue, some discrimination issues, et cetera. And they, in fact, have, uh, they originally established in the San Fernando Valley and now have expanded their efforts to greater parts of all Los Angeles. Thank you, Ms. Krull. Very good organization. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 24, call special by Council Member Holden. Mr. Holden, your button, please. Uh, we have a report here as well, it is needed. There's some driveways in my district that were damaged, and we want to know whether or not this will take care of those driveways. Mr. Holden, are we waiting for staff here?
Good morning, Mr. President, Council Members, Bill Robertson, Bureau of Street Services. Uh, Councilman Holden, could you repeat the question again, please? Some driveways damage, I think, when you're doing some resurfacing in the area and they were not repaired, yet complaints were made, or how are you responding to that? Um, if the driveways were, were damaged by our resurfacing project, uh, we will make the happened? repairs, Councilman Holden. And if you would uh, give me those locations, I will what, kindly check on those for you and give you an update. Right, this is on Longwood, 1011 Longwood Avenue in my district, uh, Ms. Armstead, and they've been complaining to the office about the damage that they caused. Would you look into that for us as yes, we I would be glad approve to. this project? I thank you, Mr. President. That was my concern. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Mr. Labonge. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Members, I think, and I hope you focus on this and focus on this all the time. Our Bureau has been able to accelerate and do a more efficient job uh, because of techniques that they have used. A lot of good things of recycling, a lot of tremendous things. Bill, give us just a brief uh, overview as far as how you see what you have done in the changes in the years that you, uh, as now the director, you have seen. I, I believe probably the biggest um, gains we've made in the, uh, the resurfacing of our streets is our ability to uh, accelerate the projects due to the types of equipment we've purchased over the last few years, our new profilers and our uh, larger paving machines. The fact that five years ago we went to a larger truck fleet that allows us to carry uh, more asphalt material uh, per truck trip, thus reducing our cost. And probably the key factor uh, that we'll be celebrating very shortly is the opening of a new recycling plant out in the uh, uh, Valley area uh, where we're reducing the cost of recycled asphalt to $19 a ton as opposed to our previous contract, which was approximately $28 a ton. Good. I just want to uh, thank you for taking uh, some of the suggestions in the audit. I know I happen to sit on both committees, uh, Public Works, and also you're going to Public Works tomorrow, I believe, to report on uh, some upgrades within the street services section. Uh, members, I think it's real important that we uh, look at ways to be very efficient with the dollar shrinking uh, in the future as we are in this particular budgetary crisis, uh, how our street services uh, performs and how they perform at a higher degree. I also wanted to make one thing a uh, compliment on Crew 152. I like to talk about this publicly. On a Saturday, they showed up at 5 a.m. at Western and Hollywood Boulevard, uh, and they grounded the street down uh, on the same day. And then on Sunday, they paved it as beautiful as any paving could be done from Western to Gower, and that type of efficiency deserves credit. And I think all the people of 152, and I know you do that around the city, but that was Hollywood Boulevard, from Gower to uh, Western Avenue. Additionally, I want you to get on Clybourne. <laughs> Clybourne's out there on the edge in Windy Gruel's district, in my district, and runs up anywhere at edges with the city of Burbank. Some parts of Burbank are better than ours. Some parts of Los Angeles are better than Burbank's. But I know if you're making a special agreement, right, and you're doing this? That's, that's correct. We've made an agreement with the city of Burbank, and uh, we'll be resurfacing actually uh, Burbank side of the street as well of our, as our side of the street. And they'll be making a contribution, I'll be done, but it's an efficient way to look at it because some members at some streets that we border on, we half patch it and uh, we want to clean that up to make it look nice for all residents. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for taking it here to the audit and the corrections that were requested and your focus and uh, leadership is managing the Bureau of Street Services which uh, covers the over 7,000 miles uh, hundreds and hundreds of public stairs, tunnels, and walkways in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Mr. Holden for a second time. Mr. President, remember, I just want to echo note what Mr. LeBron just said. You know, I came on the council 16 years ago. I have never seen our streets better than they are today. I mean, your department, in the most recent years, when they Period. There's likely to be a pothole or something. You're always out there, and, and this is this is, is slush. What do you call it? Seal that you put in there mm -hmm. to just protect the, the surface that is already there. Uh, that's preventative for years to come. And the streets of Los Angeles are better than they ever were. And I mean, the, the public should be pleased 
about what we have done, done in the past recent years to maintain the streets. Uh, in my district, I'm sure like 80, 90 percent of the streets have been resurfaced, and some more than once in the past, oh yeah, uh, in the past 16 years. <laughs> well, because they're main thoroughfares, like they go up La Brea and they go up Crenshaw and they go down, they, 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 it's like the center of the city, it's like they're called the Centrex. You have to drive through the center of the city to get the east, the west, north, south through the, the, the 10th district. So some of those streets take a real big beating. Thank you for the work you do there. Thank you. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Thank you. Next item. Item number 26, call special by Council Member Holden. Mr. Holden, item 26, and your button, please. Mr. President, members, we have a detective coming forward. Talk about this credit banking of sick time. Is that sick time or vacation time? Uh, in 1993, the uh, city passed an ordinance to allow officers to bank their vacation times or uh, their compensatory time. So since 93, the bank has grown tremendously. The bank is now over 100,000 hours, I think specifically about 102,000 hours. Uh, we just realized we have an officer that has 12 years on the job. He is severely ill with the later stages of cancer. Uh, the way the ordinance reads right now is that you must first go through your 100 percent time. Let me back up a little bit. The, the sick time. 100 percent time, then three-quarter time, and, and, and half time. time. Correct. And then you can go into the bank. That's correct. Right. And what, what you're asking us to do today is what? When he reaches, when he gets to the 50 percent bank, to let the catastrophic bank supplement him 50 percent. So 50 percent from the catastrophic bank and 50 percent from his sick leave to allow him to get 100 percent pay. Right. Mr. President, members, I understand the reports before us now. I'd like to do a verbal amendment where these police officers have given it all they can give to protect and to serve us. And when they have a catastrophic illness, we should not turn our backs on them. And whatever we can do to give them the, the income that, they, that their family needs, then we ought to do that. And what's, being ha what's happening here is that other officers put the time sick leave in the bank. Is it vacation? Uh, you, most of it's vacation, sir. Vacation yes. in the bank just for these particular reasons. And the council, 1993, was it? Yes, sir. Uh, adopted the bank type program for police officers only. Now, you're saying that they can draw on the bank after when they get down to 50 percent to make up to 100 percent. Well, actually, as it stands right now, they have to exhaust the 50 I understand. And what I'm going to suggest as an amendment, that when they draw down 100 percent of the sick leave, and then they go to the 75 percent of the sick leave, we should match the 25 percent from the bank. Uh, you have no argument for me, sir. Okay. And when they get down to the 50 percent of the sick leave, we can match that with an additional 25 percent, make it 100 percent from the bank. Because you have enough hours in the bank, is that not correct? Uh, we have. Substantial hours, yes, 100,000 hours. So you're not threatened? No. Okay. Well, Mr. President, members, I'd like to make that amendment. Do you understand that, Ms. Seal? Uh, that'll change the ordinance, and I believe a new ordinance then will have to be presented. Well, we don't have 12 votes here today, right now, anyway. No, but then it'll, the new ordinance will be set first reading again when it's presented. Well, you don't mind waiting for that kind of a deal, do That'd you? be fine. <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, you, that's an amending motion by Mr. Holden. Chair recognizes Mr. Zine. Thank you, President uh, and colleagues. And Mr. Holden, good questions on this issue. Um, Mr. Lawler, Mr. Fujioka, does this uh, also apply to firefighters and any other city employees, or it's strictly for police officers? Strictly for police officers. Has there ever been an issue, since we're going to amend this, to include firefighters, paramedics? Would it uh, be not in that same knowledge, category? Not to my knowledge, no. Because I know that the, uh, when this was brought to my attention, in this particular situation with this officer, uh, and they've got this tremendous bank available. I thought how many other public safety personnel would be impacted by this? Have we ever explored that possibility? 
Right now it is restricted to the police department because of the, um, it's, it's police officers who are putting their, their unused uh, um, time into this particular bank. And do we have a provision for other public safety in the city? Yes, in other words, why was it restricted strictly for police officers? No, uh, fire department has their own, police has their own, civilians have their own. The, ca the catastrophic leave? Correct. Yes, what we're talking about today is just a, a policy that would amend the, um, the structure, the allocation structure for the um, program for police officers. But if you want us to look at changes for the other programs. Um, well, I'm saying if we're going to we modify it, and if we're talking about modifying the ordinance, I think it would be appropriate to look at the other emergency personnel and other city employees if we have that same condition and we have a surplus of hours and when they uh, have some cancer or other catastrophic illness uh, that we should provide that since it's uh, not a negative on the taxpayers and I'm just wondering if that would be appropriate to pursue that if we're going to change this ordinance instead of piecemealing it we come back with a full package to say for this particular situation which was brought about but the other situations that may be brought about in the future, instead of coming in after the fact, have it already in place. We can do that. Okay, uh, I'll go I ahead. I just have one comment about making it a full package. What, what would be ideal for this situation is that we at least get this ordinance through first because the, the officer right now, he's approaching his 50% uh, time right now. He's, he's used up his 75% time. He's using that currently, so I would hate to delay that. Well, I have no problem with that. I, I want this to go forward, and I support that. But I'm looking at the horizon, firefighters, paramedics, other civilian personnel who have some type of catastrophic illness, we should have the plan in place for them too, and not strictly for this particular situation, but extend it out. And if maybe we can, Mr. President, have a, uh, have a report back to see or send it to committee to see how we can modify that. So we include the city family, and they all get treated fairly in this arena. Thank, Thank you. you. Before recognizing Ms. Misikowski, uh, did you say it's okay to wait on this per Mr. Holden's amending motion and now you're telling Mr. Zion you don't want to wait on this and that we can come back and amend this thing later? I'll just, have, I'll just comment toward Mr. Zion when he mentioned about, uh, when, he, when he said a package, I, did, I didn't want this to get confused with the police and the civilians so we can get this done now. I, okay. I agree but, wholeheartedly with but, that. But that still goes back to the question about Mr. Holden's amending motion. You're either okay to hold this up for some minor changes or you're not. Mr. So President, I just want to get a clear President, answer. President, can I, can I make a suggestion, please? Point of order. Mr. President, members, this is a simple amendment. It could be back before us next week for the first reading. All you're doing is changing numbers. No, I agree, Mr. Holden. Or, but told, Mr. Zion's Mr. motion goes a little farther. I understand. I'm just trying to respond to this gentleman's comment about moving this thing forward as quickly as possible or a willingness to hold off for another week? Well, a quick suggestion. We approve what's before you today and so that at the very least he gets some immediate relief. We come back with the new ordinance that addresses um, Councilman Holden's suggestion and the new ordinance will also um, be brought in to include other public safety you know, positions, but we, we, we make sure that the relief goes to the officer immediately at the, at the okay. proposed level today and then next week, we'll, we'll bring in a new old ordinance for um, consistent with Mr. Holden's motion, which would result in the officer getting an even higher benefit okay. when the second motion comes Mr. Forward. Holden, is that okay? All right. That's all we needed is some clarification. Ms. Misikowski? That's fine. Now, as I want to clarify, let's get this in so that this uh, particular uh, employee can get relief as immediately as possible and then work on the other issues that Mr. Zion is talking about also as quickly as possible, but not interrupt this. Okay. And Ms. Misikowski is almost the final speaker. Mr. Zine. Uh, just a uh, follow-up. Do we have to have them come back to committee, or how do we work well, that for the other? This particular action before us today will proceed with the manner you requested, and Mr. Holden, yes, we'll come back with, to committee with an amending ordinance form, and uh, we'll come through the council accordingly. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Members to be heard, seeing none. We have a combined uh, Holden Zion amending motion. We'll consider that without objection and we'll take up item 26 as amended. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. And that ordinance is over for second reading uh, for to February 18th. 
Next item, please. Uh, item number 35 was called special for an amending motion. 35A has been distributed to the council members. Okay, and I believe that's technical in nature. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we shall consider item 35 as amended. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item. Item number 37, called special by Council Member Garcetti. Mr. Garcetti. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this item today, which deals with uh, BTAC colleagues and sunsetting when it will cease to be in existence is a healthy thing in terms of making sure that we get our work done. I also uh, share, I know, with many of the council members that reform of our business tax code is probably the most important thing we can do on our revenue side. But on our economic development of the city, it's m one of the most substantial things that we can do in this city. Um, we have currently scheduled, I know, an economic development employment committee. Um, one of the items that was recommended by BTAC on single category filing. And I think it's important that we move legislatively on many of the other proposals, obviously the holy grail being figuring out some way to get away from a gross receipts tax and move towards a net gains tax in this city. Um, and clearly there's been a lot of people who've worked on that in BTAC, and that has to be one of our top legislative priorities uh, for this coming year. Um, I would encourage colleagues to continue to try to find legislative ways for us to move on that business tax efforts. We will continue to do that in the Economic Development and Employment Committee in the meantime also on finding strategic categories for um, industries we want to keep or attract uh, in Los Angeles, uh, attract to Los Angeles. And I think that this is, this is important that we sunset it so that we know that our work has to be done by then, but we certainly shouldn't use it as a, as a deadline, but merely our last possible date. And if we can do things earlier, that's really what the businesses of Los Angeles are not only demanding, but deserve. Thank you. Ms. Gruel. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, also, I want to stand up uh, with my colleague, uh, Councilmember Garcetti, and I know Councilmember Padilla as well, who supports looking at our business tax reform. Uh, the BTAC has done an incredible job thus far in their activities and their recommendations that we are hoping will come forward to City Council as soon as possible. We need to make sure that Los Angeles is a business-friendly city, that it is a city where we can uh, make it simpler for people to participate in the process. We hear so frequently and read frequently about businesses going to surrounding communities. We need to save uh, those businesses for the city of Los Angeles and the BTAC and their hard work. These are individuals who have other jobs and businesses who have actually given of their time and energy to improve uh, the way the city does business. And uh, we've all been following in the last several weeks and months some of the issues where um, the city stumbled on that issue. And we need to bring back confidence that we are serious about business re tax reform here in Los Angeles. So I stand in support as well for the committee to um, continue, uh, to continue to nudge us, continue to be our conscience, and to work with them uh, to successfully implement many of the recommendations uh, with the mayor and the full city council. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. LaVange. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And Ms. Gruel, thank you. And it's very important uh, as we uh, look at this whole issue of our Business Tax Advisory Committee and the work uh, to be able to move, to be able to take advantage of the unfortunate crisis where we are in the budget, to look at reforming taxes. Because everywhere I go, uh, and the people who, uh, we all talked about housing earlier, I just remember the housing developer this morning, he talked about taxes, 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 and how it impacts whether he builds in Seattle, San Antonio, or Los Angeles. So I just wanted to thank all of those who've been very involved in the charge to uh, uh, deal with business tax reform and, alpha, and to move ahead in this area of uh, reinstating, uh, redesignating, working ahead on the issues of business tax reform, which is so key and important. And I think we've got to do it. It's a tough time. You've got to do it now. I know now, if not now, when? If not when? You know that story. Anyway, I thank you and I appreciate your leadership, Mr. President, on this tax reform as we look at the situation through all the business of the City of Los Angeles. Thank you, Mr. LaVange. Other members wishing to be heard? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Please close the roll and tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That is approved. Next item, please. Item number 42, call special by Council Member Zine. Mr. Zine. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, on uh, this item, College Awareness Month, uh, Assemblymember Fran Pavley and members of my staff and her staff in Center C. Q were at Taft High School uh, two weeks ago Saturday promoting this. And I just want to remind our viewers, listeners, that if you have a, a student who looks wants to go to college, Cal grants are available and the applications must be received by March 3rd. And there was a program where 50 schools in LA Unified were involved in this project, and uh, in the San Fernando Valley, the response was not that great. But there was money there, millions of dollars, but the deadline is March 3rd, so anyone interested in leaving high school and pursuing further education, those grants are available. Again, contact the counselor at the local high school, and millions of dollars available to the Cal Grant program. Thank you. Uh, let me recognize Mr. LaBonge. I just wanted to stand to salute Mr. Zion, and I wanted to stand because college is so important, and to help young people find out how to get there. I just, uh, this week, Mr. Garcetti and I honored Los Angeles City College on Sunday evening at a dinner at Tay's Restaurant on Sunset Boulevard with the Highland Democratic Club, and it was very nice to honor City College because I reminisced about what college meant to me in getting to step up. And uh, I think the awareness program that has, and I know the programs that our mayor has on college uh, scholarships, uh, all this is extremely important. So all of us should take heed to this College Awareness Month and spread the word, whatever the college is, whether it's a university as great as USC or UCLA or as impactful as Pomona or Occidental or a great community colleges like Harvard or City or Southwest or East LA, all of Valley, Pierce, all of them are extremely important. Get the step up. So I just want to encourage everybody and encourage our departments to uh, make sure they inform their employees the importance of the College Awareness Month and take advantage of college. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBonge. This banner is now before us. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That matter is approved. Next item, Madam President, item number five is still on the desk. This is a street lighting, excuse me, district in Council District 1. Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. Um, I believe we're in a position where we can move forward. I know we're having this discussion with uh, the individual who did step up. He is a property owner. He does want to improve his lights. Um, is anyone on staff here to answer a couple of questions? Is there anyone from the Bureau of Street Lighting? So, can we continue to Mr. tomorrow? Mr. Rose, this will be in again on uh, March 4th for the ordinance and the hearing. So I don't know if you want to continue it to tomorrow and then hear it again on the 4th. So this was just an opening of a protest hearing? Yes. So we'll right. come back on March 4th for the continuation of the hearing and the approval and assessment. So we can have street lighting there at that time. We can do it tomorrow, though. Are you, okay, you want to continue this until tomorrow? Yes. All right. Okay. That will be the order. Uh, there is special one, uh, Madam President, uh, on the desk. It's an item not on Council's agenda, and it's been presented by Council Member Padilla, seconded by Council Member Grohl, and the City Attorney will explain the need to make the findings. Thank you. I read into the record the findings for the Council to consider. On February 10th, 2003, the rental units of 18 families were destroyed by fire at 9010 Cedros Avenue. The Housing Department has determined the tenants are eligible to receive calamity-based displaced tenant relocation assistance funds. Pursuant to the government code, council must first determine whether there is a need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of council after the posting of today's agenda. If such a finding is made, the department requests that the council authorize the disbursement of such funds as set forth in the substantive motion. All right, members, we've heard the city attorney uh, enunciate the findings. If there's no question on the findings, open the roll so we can take uh, action on the matter. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. All right, that matter is properly before us. Let me recognize Councilmember Padilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleagues, you step down to speak on this special one. Uh, first of all, to ask for your support 
But second, to explain exactly what this uh, incident was, as many of you awoke yesterday morning and as we were watching the news, getting ready for work or listening to news radio on the drive in, uh, you probably heard or saw a lot of media coverage about an apartment fire uh, originally reported in the Mission Hills area, it actually turned out to be in the Panorama City area. Uh, and so I was out there on the scene and wanted to call this matter special to highlight the situation and really thank uh, the Los Angeles Fire Department for a tremendous response, for a tremendous job in putting out this fire and minimizing damage both to the building and to families, and also to thank the American Red Cross for responding to the scene and for their ongoing efforts to uh, try to help these families, these displaced families, get back on their feet. Uh, of particular note, uh, this is a building that uh, my estimate is anywhere between 50 and 60 units, uh, 21 of which are now gone. 21 units gone and more than 21 families displaced. Uh, within about 20, 25 minutes, there were 100 firefighters on the scene. 130 firefighters fighting this fire within half an hour, and within half an hour that fire was not only contained, but it was out. And according to the captain on the scene, it is a miracle that nobody died in this fire. We did have about half a dozen injuries, but uh, this was the incident that we all heard about yesterday, so you understand the correlation between uh, the incident yesterday and our urgent need to act to help these 21 families uh, that have been displaced and an opportunity to commend the Los Angeles Fire Department for a job very well done. I ask for your support. We've heard we have the recommendation before us. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. That matter is approved. Forthwith on that. Next item, Madam President, this is the time for comments from the public on items not on Council's agenda. All right, we have a few public comment speaker cards that were submitted. Let me first call Nigel Cox. Is Nigel Cox present? Joan Rivard. Ruth Sarnoff and Bill Murray. Okay, it looks like Mr. Murray is present. Please come forward and speak. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Bill Murray. I'm here representing the Los Angeles Community Policing Group uh, at LACP.org. Many of you know who I am. Uh, you'll know that what we cover in, at LACP.org is uh, issues that are pertinent to the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, but also the, the general issues uh, involving gangs, domestic violence, homeless and uh, mentally ill people, and community involvement in general in government. We have a big portion of what we, uh, we have committed to uh, regarding the, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, the Neighborhood Council System. I rise, though, to, to speak about the topic that I just mentioned that is on everyone's agenda, and that's the gang situation. Um, $100,000 was today uh, allocated towards a gang program that's designed for prevention and, and intervention, and that's excellent. It's a drop in the bucket for what I believe we need in Los Angeles. Because we, are, we do tend to deal with the suppression arm of things, and we're doing a little better with that now, and I'm, I'm happy to report that uh, Chief Bratton's system is, looks like one that will work. It will integrate different agencies, including federal, state, and local agencies. Uh, and it will actually get people talking to each other in the same room, which is brand new for us. However, the real solution to the problem, I believe, is uh, a full press, press court with a vision that's much longer, like a 10-year plan. Uh, and this needs to be coordinated, and I would ask the City Council, the Mayor, and the LAPD to take leading roles in this, because we, rather than a little bit here and a little bit there, we need an overview. There are other districts besides Harbor, obviously, there's, the, 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 there's a couple in the Valley that are very badly in, in, uh, in need of, of gang intervention and prevention programs. Also South Central, a couple of divisions down there, the Boyle Heights area, the Lincoln Heights area. I could go on and on. There are many of them. But there is no coordination of any of this. And that's why I asked, that's why I wanted to make a public comment. I really think that that is what makes a difference because the, without a 10-year plan, without a vision that includes a 10-year plan, Today's five-year-old is 15-year-olds with a gun on the street. And the children who are now coming into the gangs, they're in a situation where they are they're generations old. They have no other alternatives. And we need a coordinated effort that shows them that, you know, it's, it's also cool to become an explorer, or it's also cool to, to pursue an art career, or it's also cool to do whatever. 
and there is no coordinated effort is the point I want to make today. And I call on the City Council to take a lead along with the Mayor and the, the Police Department. It's very important. Community policing programs all over the world show this. Without the police taking a leading role, they don't have to be the ones that actually implement the process, but they must partner with it very strongly. It will, it will not succeed. That's what community policing is about. So I, I encourage, I'm very grateful that you've done this for Harbor Division. I think there are several other divisions that deserve at least similar uh, amounts of, uh, of, of attention. But overall, we need to, we need to be looking at this from a 10-year view. The intervention and the prevention arms are, are what's going to get us out of the gang problem that we have, not just the suppression. The suppression will bring the crime statistics down for today, perhaps, but they will not resolve the problem. And that is that children need other choices. And that's, that starts with the five-year-old right through the teenager. Thank you very much for your time, Ms. President. Thank you. Will there anyone? Sorry. I'm Ruth Zornoff. Um, I came today with a message in support of the Garcetti resolution that I think is one of the uh, resolutions under consideration. And I do have handouts. Um, um, the thousands of sick Gulf War veterans, a sickness passed on in birth defects to their children, and the many sick, mentally ill, and homeless veterans right here in our city should have taught us one thing, that the casualties of war extend beyond our battlefield losses. After the first Gulf War, the water, garbage, sewage, and electrical systems for millions of Iraqis were no more. As people who deal every day with the needs of millions of Los Angeles residents, I ask you, even with our vast resources, what would life be like for us if we lost even one of those systems in our city? Nothing about war is cheap. There is loss of life, degradation of the environment, destruction of farmland, the spread of disease, the creation of orphans and refuge, refugees. Many of the weapons used in the Gulf War were warheads and other military equipment hardened with highly poisonous depleted uranium associated with Gulf War syndrome. Those weapons were the great success story of the war, piercing enemy tanks like they were made of butter. They were not, however, a great success story for our soldiers who scouted the burnt out irradiated tanks and were downwind from the fighting, yet never warm, nor for the Iraqis still suffering from the effects of a radiated landscape. And those smart bombs, only after the war did we learn only 6% of the bombs dropped were smart bombs. The others, unfortunately, were dumb ones. And the babies supposedly thrown out of incubators by Iraqi soldiers and then bayoneted, that story was exposed on 60 Minutes to have been a totally false, invented story. The 15-year-old girl weeping before cameras was in fact the daughter of the ambassador to the US from Kuwait. On 60 Minutes, she recanted publicly to the world it was a hoax. Like the oft-repeated footage of the smart bombs, it's not hard to believe the unbelievable when the drums of war become strong. And war is not cheap for even the victors. That part of every war, of every budget, which pays in some way for past, present, and future wars, robbing local and state as well as federal budgets, were it possible to accurately tally, would far exceed the acknowledged costs of war already in the trillions. And just as war begets war, successful solutions without war will encourage more aggressive seeking of peaceful solutions. I urge you to join the great cities of the world in helping to prevent a preventable war and to support the efforts of the United Nations for a peaceful resolution of the Iraqi crisis. I urge you to join with the Pope, with Nelson Mandela, with the National AFL-CIO, the National Federations of British and other European unions, and the thousands of prominent individuals, religious organizations, and nonprofits here and abroad saying no to war, no war in Iraq. 
It's not too late to turn around the worst manifestation of our destructive behaviors as a species, war. A first step toward peace is already being taken by people throughout the world. Can you ever remember a time before when people throughout the world, in cities large and small, rallied in such numbers to prevent a war? This can become the much heralded century of peace, a new day where humanity uses its best creative thinking to rise above the barbarism of war. It will, however, require new thinking at every le level. I urge members of the City Council of the City of Los Angeles to support the original resolution. Tweak it if you must, but please don't let this opportunity pass to send a clear peace message to the White House that U.S. bombing of Iraqi cities and first strike use of nuclear weapons are not acceptable. And I'd like to, quote, to, to close with a quote. Beware the leader who bangs the drums of war in order to whip the citizenry into a patriotic fervor, for patriotism is indeed a double-edged sword. It both emboldens the blood just as it narrows the mind. And when the drums of war have reached a fever pitch and the blood boils with hate and the mind has closed, the leader will have no need in seizing the rights of the citizenry. Rather, the citizenry, infused with fear and blinded by patriotism, will offer up all of their rights unto the leader, and gladly so. How do I know? For this is what I have done, and I am Caesar, Julius Caesar. And I thank you for your time, and I would appreciate someone getting the handouts to um, members of the, the, the sergeant council and, and others. And thank you, Ms. Arnoff. The sergeant in arms is coming to pick those okay. up. I also, the, have, I also uh, have two tapes on depleted uranium and on the aftermath of the Iraqi war, which I would be happy to share with any members of the council who would wish to see them. Uh, let, let, me, let the sergeant take those, and we'll make them available. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that concludes our public comment period. Madam Clerk, what else is before us? Council has motions for posting and referral. They are posted and referred. And that clears the desk, Madam President. All right, are there any announcements? Any adjourning motions? Members of the council, any adjourning motions? Seeing none? Oh, oh we do have some. All right, please stand, everyone. Mr. President, members, uh, just said to announce this young man, James Edward Sanders III, uh, just 10 years old and in the fifth grade at 68th Street School. His body was found on Monday, February 3rd, in a pool at Fremont High School. The victim was in apparent drowning. Police are continuing to investigate the circumstances around James' death the pool office has been vandalized. Uh, school friends and classmates will remember James as a spirited and lively youngster. Remembering by everyone who met him, James lived with his grandmother who was unable to pay for the funeral. McCormick Mortuary in Inglewood stepped in and has generously donated its services and a casket. His teacher, Earl Hunter, has worked tirelessly to raise funds for the burial, and we made a contribution. The funeral services will take place February 12th at McCormick Mortuary at 635 South Prairie, Bullock, Prairie. Burial will follow at Inglewood Park Cemetery. I just might add that there was a guy named uh, Supervisor Kenneth Hahn who put pools in the community where they were never won, never had them before. He was chairman of the Recreation and Park Committee as a member of the Los Angeles City Council. This is worth noting. And when he made a request for swimming pools elsewhere, he, they needed his signature, as he told the story. And, but they would never give one to him. So when they stacked up where they were not being built, they asked Supervisor Hahn, Councilman Hahn, Hahn, where are those swimming pool requests? He said, when you approve one for me, then I'll sign off on the others. These people have been denied swimming, and unfortunately, this accident occurred. At one point in time, when I worked for him, 
There was a drowning in a swimming pool such as this. And the stripes in the pool shielded the kid's body and it could not be identified. And he corrected that problem. So as we go on in life as elected officials, there are things that come will be brought to your attention that you will have the power and the ability to correct. We haven't solved all the problems, but I'm sure you will have your problems of your own and continue to solve them. This young man, unfortunately, died early at the age of 10, and we adjourn in his memory. Thank you for allowing me to make those comments. Thank you, Mr. Holden. Any other tributes? If not, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you. Council is adjourned.